Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me on this Friday, April 14th in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. As the World Turns alum, Jamie Dudney, who played Georgia Tucker, is here today to look back at her time working with the late Elizabeth Hubbard, who we lost last weekend, Ben Jorgensen, and Nathaniel Marston, among many others. Jamie, as you all know, is the daughter of legendary country singer Barbara Mandrell and currently lives in Nashville with her son, Jax. I am so excited to welcome my friend, Jamie Dudney, to the locker room. Jamie! Alan, hello! <laughs> it, it has been a very long time. Yeah, let's not talk about how long it's been. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's... um you know, really a perfect week to have you, you know, having lost Liz last weekend. Um, you know, just when you think of Liz Hubbard, what automatically comes to oh. mind? Wow, what a great picture. Oh my goodness, Alan. So many things come to mind. Um, and I, I don't think it's by accident that I was honored to be on your show today and that I get to talk about Liz because she made such an impact on me personally and, of course, professionally that I could work opposite Elizabeth Hubbard, <laughs> you know, was a uh, a gift. And I learned the ropes or some of a few of the ropes from her. I learned everything I could. And, and what an incredible woman and so supportive of a young actress that didn't know what she was doing and... You know, I got a message from her. It was a voicemail. Of course, this is before iPhones and all that stuff. But when when I left the show, she left me the most beautiful message. Oh, wow. And on it, she said things like, um, we had real moments and I believed you. And thank you for calling me Aunt Lou. I always love that. Of course, I call her Aunt Lou because I have my own Aunt Lou, Louise, Louise Mandrell. <laughs> so that's where that came from. But it, um, she made an impact in my life that will never be forgotten. Yeah. Oh my God! I hope I can find a clip of that. I don't remember you calling her Aunt Lou, but how brilliant! <laughs> how brilliant to call her Aunt Lou. Oh my God! It was natural for me to do uh. that. Yeah, seriously, seriously. Well, we're going to come back to Oakdale, but let's go back. What was your childhood like growing up in Nashville um, with two brothers? <laughs> well, I'm the middle child, so um, I'll tell you anything you want to know. I have lots of issues and all that stuff, like all of us. <laughs> no, I'm teasing you. My older brother, um, we're six years apart. Um, so we didn't really like each other till I was 18 years old <laughs> and he was 24. And then my younger brother is nine years younger than me. And so he was my baby besides my son. He's really the only diaper I'd ever changed in life. <laughs> no baby but you no were more. prepared. But I you was were prepared. Then. <laughs> um, but he's not a baby anymore. He's actually my boss now which is kind of fun. And I, that, I run and operate one of his companies. So yeah, that, living, that's a, living a normal life here in Nashville, Alan. I, I love that. Well, like I said in the intro, your mom is country legend, Barbara Mandrell. Look at, look at this. <laughs> that's us camping in Washington. Um, you know, having a mom or uh, a parent that's a traveling musician she was on the road about 200 days out of the year, but every summer we knew that we were going to go camping for two weeks outside of Washington state in the middle of the woods. And so there were, there were times that I could count on like that picture that you just saw of us counting of real intimate longevity of us being able to be together for an extended amount of time. But yeah, she, you know, I was a road baby as they call us kids of traveling musicians. And I was in every state um, in a tour bus besides Alaska and Hawaii, of course, before the age of two. So wow. yeah. Yeah. So, I was curious. Do you, do you have a memory of realizing that, she wasn't just mom, that she was Barbara Mandrell? No, I always knew that there was a difference between her and other jobs. 
I always knew that it was abnormal. It was normal to me. And I, I think God gave me the ability to understand that too at an early age. Um, so I got to go to a different state fair, you know, back in the, the late seventies when I was touring with her, she was at every state fair in the continental United States. So as a kid, <laughs> To wake up and I'd pull the curtain back on the tour bus and I'd see all new rides and I'd ride rides all day. And then mom would do the show at night and I would watch a movie because the movie's about two hours. That's about how long her show would be. So I'd sit on the bus and I'd watch Mary Poppins or Pete's Dragon or something like that. And then um, after the show, I'd sit in the autograph line with her, with the fans and on to the next fair. So it was fun, fun an incredible childhood. And then at the well, age of, yes. Oh, there we are. <laughs> I mean, hello. That's me That's... and Whitney Houston at the Special Olympics in Washington, DC. Incredible. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. I got to and, and lots. Is, oh! <laughs> is this, is this LL? I'm not. That is LL Cool J. Oh yeah. Wow. He, I really, I wasn't a hundred percent sure when I looked. But oh my goodness! He he's a baby. He's a baby in that he's picture. A, I think he's about nineteen or twenty in that photo. Wow. And he down for a celebrity softball game that my mom was hosting, and um, he I got to show him around our house at the time, and I was twelve years old and super awkward, as you can see in that photo. <laughs> but he made me feel real special. He uh, yeah, he made me feel really special. And uh, he was a That's nice, awesome. I, nice I think guy. From what, from what you could see, he seems like a really great human being. Great, great guy. Yeah. I met a lot of cool people. That's, that's the fun part about being a celebrity kid. I can remember being in the airport one time and seeing Ricky Schroeder and being like, Mom, go introduce yourself. <laughs> I got to meet <laughs> I'd, use her, I'd use her in that way some too. But, that's um, great. You know, I got, did, I got did my... You ever, um, yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was going to say I got my, my first acting job um, at four years old, my SAG and after card on Barbara Mandrell and the Mandrell Sisters, which was on NBC in 1980 and 81. And I played Little Erlene. I was a series regular. So that was my first acting job. Um, not too far of a stretch, but uh, it was a way for me to get to see my mother and my family and have so much fun. Um, and get my union card at four years old, which is I love cool. that. One of the fans actually had just written that that's who you played in the TV yeah. movie of her life. Um, and Dinah yeah. said, I so loved your mother, Miss Barbara. I was in her fan club for over 20 years. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. Did she go to any fan club breakfasts? So my mom, you know, a different thing that mom used to do, and I don't know about other entertainers, is she would host these big fan club breakfasts during what we called Fanfare, which is now CMA Fest. And all the mom's fans of the fan club were able to come have breakfast with us as a family and play, like, Price is Right or Family Feud or some kind of game that my dad would host. And so we really, the fans were and are like family to us, very similar to soap fans in the sense that they're just good old American people, you know, country music folks, soap opera folks, they're the same people. I mean, I could say the same about any kind of genre of music. There's good no, people. But I, I see where you're, yeah, I see where you're going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were four when you did that movie? No, um, what she was referring to, the person that asked the question, is they did a movie of my mom's life, I think it was 1997, called Get to the Heart, which was based on her autobiography, Get to the Heart. And I reprised the role of my Anne Erleen in the movie of yeah. mom's life. Yeah. Gotcha. So, uh -huh. But did, did you grow up knowing you wanted to be an actress, or did you ever consider <sighs> doing what mom did? No, not really. I was a dancer um, for about 12 years. And then, so I love the stage. I love performing comfortable in front of the stage or on the stage and around it. And I was knowledgeable about television and things like that. And um, then something happened my senior year. I think it was my senior year. And my mom's agent at the time 
um, happened to have my picture in his office in Nashville and a producer watched through and said, oh, who's this girl? And my mom's agent said, oh, well, that's so-and-so and and she's a fantastic actress. Yeah, she's great, not knowing. And it was a pilot that was on CBS that I ended up auditioning for. I'm like, what's a pilot? Um, Which is a... um, an audition, so to speak, of a television show for the network. And so that's what a pilot is. And I got to do that pilot and it aired. I got the part and um, it did not go to series. I have a memory of that. If you want me to tell you reasons why, maybe listeners would find this interesting. You know um, why it didn't go to series? I do. And, and, and this will make sense to you. So it was going to air as a movie of the week. Um, but it was a pilot, like I just mentioned. And what the network needed to know was, is it going to get good ratings? Can we give it longevity and, and, and get nine or 13 shows or a season out of it? And it was a great show. We had phenomenal actors and actresses in it. Um, Brandon Tartikoff produced, executive produced it. Of course. Oh, wow. it was the- yeah. So it was going to go. And, and like, I'm like, wow, I'm, going to get to be on a television show in Nashville, my hometown, because it was about country music, of course. It was the original Nashville, you know, that great show that had all those seasons. Um, so anyway, the night I loved that, that it, show. Wasn't it fabulous? Yes. I loved the, it. Yeah. The day that X's and O's was the name of the pilot that I did. The day that it aired on CBS was also the day that the white Bronco went down the interstate. <laughs> So we had no ratings at all. <laughs> and uh, I graduated high school and, and that was that. That's very funny. <laughs> but you know that that's what they attribute a lot of the decline of soap operas to is the white Bronco, it, the trial, basically the trial, basically the trial. The, reality television, the first taste really of the first reality. taste of reality. Correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you have a favorite song of your mom's? Oh, Wow. I mean, uh, there are songs I like better than others, certainly. <laughs> I'm a really, as an adult, I have enjoyed uh, listening to songs that I'd never heard before, mainly on her earlier cuts, her earlier albums. Um, and her, her big hits, of course, I love. Everybody loves them. But it's the, the earlier hits and the earlier tracks that I'm really enjoying as an adult. You know, mom would take hits of R&B like I've been loving you too long to stop now from Otis Redding or um if loving you is wrong I don't want to be right you know all these great R and woman to woman all these great R&B songs and she would put a little twist on them and make them country um I really like those songs a lot the Miguel just said, I remember seeing Barbara in the commercial breaks for As the World Turns doing the Sun Sweet prune commercials and the Visa Fabric commercials. She always looked so lovely. That's so funny. But I'll probably tell you before you, you probably <laughs> before you were there. Is there anything um fans would be surprised that you can share about mom? Oh, goodness. About my, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I could probably share. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, my mother chose to retire completely in 1997. She got her first paying job. Big decision. Big, big decision. decision. She got her first paying job at the age of 11. And so when you work from the age of 11 to she was in her late forties when she retired, you know, it's been, her career was a span of four decades. So people would say, why would she retire so early? And she just had been there, done that in the sense of I've worked for four decades. I've won all the awards I want to win. I've done everything. I'm full. I'm complete. I just want to be a mom. And so she sold every, she had her, well, I'll start by saying she had her, her last show at the grand old Opry. Um, and it was well, amazing. That, that's, that's a perfection way to, yeah. that's the way to go out in, in country it music. Is. For sure. For um, sure. Side note, the, the night, the night before I was born, my mother played the Grand Old Opry. So I, the night, <laughs> I was, the night before, the night before <laughs> I was scheduled C-section around her tour schedule. 
So I wow. was legit the road baby, but, um, you know, so she worked all those years. She had got all the successes and everything. And she just wanted to be a mom and a wife. And so she had her last show at the Grand Ole Opry in 1997. She sold all of her instruments, which I'm not happy about because I would cherish one of those now. <laughs> but she, um, she the, well, I take that back. Her steel guitar is in the Country Music Hall of Fame, which she's a member of. And the Dobro is in the Musicians Hall of Fame, which she was the first female member of. And so, wow. and my grandparents bought her both those instruments. So that's why she kept them. But she that's just higher. I think, I think people would be really surprised by that. I mean, they know she's oh. retired, but I think they thought maybe she'll come back and maybe this and maybe that, but they don't know her in that way. She's yeah, stubborn. Yeah, she really made it. She made a a decision and stuck to it. And not, I mean, you know, we, we can we can name some artists who've who've had, you know, ten farewell tours or something. <laughs> um, well, I one, that she's as talented as she is stubborn. So when she says she's doing something, <laughs> she's doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Tammy uh, says I saw Jamie signing autograph autographs besides Barbara back when the TV show was on and then got to meet Jamie after at Fan, uh, Fantanel? Fantanel. Is that a Fontanel? I don't know. Probably Fanfare. Probably, I don't know, but yeah, that's probably. awesome. Thank you. So I used to sign autographs with my mom, um, but if I got to her autograph photo before mom got to it, mom said I would sign Jamie across her face. <laughs> <laughs> Right across mom's face. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you were practicing early. <laughs> that, that is really great. Well, let's let's go back to uh, As the World Turns and the audition for Georgia Tucker. Were you living in California or? Yeah. Yes, I was. I was. I had moved to Los Angeles at the age of 20, almost 21, to be an actress after X's and O's. Um, I stayed in Nashville. I went to college for a semester and I was traveling back and forth auditioning and I booked a few jobs. And so I just decided with the, you know, approval of my parents that I would be putting college on pause and going and living my dream, so to speak. And so I had been in LA auditioning for about eight months and um, my manager called and said, Hey, do you want to go do a, a soap in New York. And I was like, oh, you know, I never considered New York city. That's just really intimidating for me. LA was not as intimidating because I knew a few people there. Um, but I said, sure, why not? You know, my mom always gave me advice. She said, audition for everything. It's fun to turn stuff down. So if you get the part and you don't want to do it, you can say no, but go audition for everything. And so I did, but Funnily enough, the same, the, the week before As the World Turns called for me to go audition, I screen tested for Days of Our Lives and for Sunset Beach, which um, was an Aaron Spelling soap opera that mom actually did for a couple months. But anyway, I was screen testing two screen tests in one week. I was like, wow, I'm doing it. <laughs> actually going to be able to do this and I'm going to get one of these and I was feeling so good about myself and okay this might just work out and then I didn't get either one of them and I'm like oh why why didn't I get that and then of course you get in your head and all these things and so I'm a woman of faith and I just give it to God and I get out of the way and I just do my best and I try to do the next right thing and have good intentions and and so then the next week is when my manager said, how about a soap in New York? And I was like, oh, sure, okay. Never thinking that I would get the part because I just lost two others. And um, I screen tested, they flew me to New York, which was really fun. Put me up at a hotel in Times Square, which was really fun. <laughs> I, screen I actually screen tested with Terry Kahn, who ended up playing Katie. So Katie, or excuse me, Terry and I both screen tested for Georgia about with uh, eight of the girls or so, and uh, didn't hear anything for a couple, flew back home, back to LA, didn't hear anything. Yeah, I keep saying phone it, phone. I do remember you both, I remember it so vividly now, one got Katie and one got Georgia. 
Yes. And so they flew us both from LA back to New York to screen test with about eight other girls, another round of screen tests. Um, we screen tested with Nathaniel Marsden, who played Eddie Silva. And um, literally, it felt a bit, not panicky on set, but it felt like, wow, we got to We got to get this booked. And sure enough, that night, um, Terry and I are both at the hotel and I get the phone call. You got the part of Georgia. We're messengering you your scripts. You are to report to set at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning with your lines <laughs> memorized. And I'm like, OK, God. Here we go. <laughs> you held out. I didn't get those soaps. Now I'm moving to New York City to work with Broadway actors and Elizabeth Hubbard. Um, and I start work in 12 hours. Okay. <laughs> so I go downstairs and I see sweet Terry. And she looked at me and she goes, I guess you got the part, huh? And I was like, yes, because she probably saw the look of panic on my face. And she said, well, they said they're going to bring me in for another character. And I'm like, oh, I hope that happens. And you hear stuff like that. Oh, I'll bring you in for something else. And, and I was like, oh, and then they did. And it was such a blessing to have Terry as my rival on the show. Of course, Georgia and Katie were both after Eddie. And um, she was my best friend during that whole show. And she, I wouldn't say we're best friends now, but we love each other. And that's that's for sure. And I'd be there for her in a heartbeat. You know, she has her own life and I do too. We don't live in the same states anymore, but I love her. Um, and it was that. I, I you, you gals were special. I love oh, both of you. So love that. Love that. That's sweet. Love Thank that. You. Yes, um, I just you, decided. So you had to learn all those lines overnight. Do you do you yeah. remember that first day? Oh yeah. Oh yes. Yeah, I was tired. Honestly, <laughs> I was tired. Um, in in raw emotion and in real energy. You know, I didn't have any of that nervous energy because I was just rip, like just raw and exhausted from traveling back and forth and just you know, life. And I was able to exhale and actually have a, a good day on my first day. It was fun. I'll tell you this real fast though. So, um, we had a director, I, her name, she was a female. Maria. Maria. Thank you, Alan. Maria yes. Wagner. <laughs> it was my first director. Yes. Thank you. And she came up to me and, um, she said, okay, now this is your tag. And I was like, okay, okay. And I don't remember who I asked, maybe one of our stage managers, like Jen Blood or or Nancy was, I was like, what's a tag? <laughs> <laughs> That's where, you know, they close in on you and you look into space and despair. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm on a soap opera. <laughs> hey, I, I didn't know this. Did you ever watch a soap before no, you got no, on? Not really. I, I wasn't really allowed to watch soap operas growing up because of the risque, you know. That's a smart mom. <laughs> I mean, I my mom let me, you know, I definitely. Watched, well, you know, but, yeah. it was probably honestly more my nanny at that time because my mom was working a lot. And my nanny, you know, that's one good, great thing my parents did. Any, any professional parents that are not a, able to be around their children all the time, get someone in your kid's life like a nanny for the longevity. I had her for 13 years and wow. she would not allow me to watch soap operas. But in high school, I did watch Days of Our Lives a little bit because my high school boyfriend was in love with Carrie Brady on Days of Our Lives. <laughs> who, in real life, ended up being one of my very best friends, Christy Clark. I was in her I wedding. Know. And um, I'm still very, I'm great best friends with Christy still to this day. So no, um, I was not allowed to watch soap operas except a little bit of Days of Our Lives. <laughs> so funny. That is so funny. But you really started working with Nathaniel right, right away, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that they brought me on the show. Um, I was storyline dictated. Georgia and Eddie, Nathaniel's character, yeah. Eddie. We're, we're together. So they bring characters on the show and it really is a puzzle piece. 
And so I was a piece of the puzzle in the Margot Eddy storyline. Um, but in hindsight, you know, I was Samantha's daughter. I came to find my long lost mom, um, stay with my rich Aunt Lucinda. Um, <laughs> Aunt Lou. Um, and my Aunt Lou, which was so much fun. Um, but yeah, I, I basically, I think, I believe you'd have to ask the writers, but I believe I was on the show mainly for Eddie. Yeah. And then, of course, um, they brought in Chris Hughes, which was played by Ben yeah. Jorgensen. Yeah. Um, really um, but go, we'll, we'll come to Ben in a minute. But going back to Nathaniel, because um, I know you and I talked, did yes. you, you, you two had a difficult relationship. Did it start <laughs> out immediately that way? Or did Nathaniel's behavior lead it to that, you know, mm -hmm. no, I think from the, I, I think from the start... Honestly, and even if Nathaniel was still walking on earth, I would probably say this and he would agree with me from the start. Um, there was tension and I think it had to do with his girlfriend at the time. Uh, <laughs> I can remember. It, isn't that always, isn't that uh, always the case? It, it, yes. I, I would believe not. that. I could, uh, and I'm not saying that about Nathaniel. I'm just saying that when, when a, a woman is playing opposite, someone else's partner, there could be friction. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. I mean, there could be. There shouldn't be. There shouldn't there be. But there could be because people are, it, it's more to do with their, you know, it was probably Nathaniel's girlfriend's insecurity or Nathaniel's uh, inability to communicate that this is my working partner. <laughs> right. right. You well, know. you know, she was at all the screen tests, which was fun. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's he, that's he, uncomfortable. It was, it was, you know, whatever. I'm a, I'm yeah. a person. I just, so at the beginning, you know, it was a little bit more difficult. Now, I am the type of person, if you do not like me, you are now my mission to make me, to make you like me. I'm not that way anymore. That was like, you know, in your 20s, yeah, you want everything to like you, you and all that. We, we want to be liked. I, right. Yeah, believe right. it. So I, we did not have the best relationship. We faked it a lot. We did the best we could, you know, off, off camera, on camera. Um, you know, Eddie, the storyline worked. Eddie didn't like Georgia. So I could use that. So acting for me is just living a truth in an imaginary circumstance. And so it was easy for me to feel rejected by Eddie because I felt rejected by Nathaniel, in a sense. Now, I will say acting is acting, but you do have to have truth when you act. And I went to Martha Byrne, who was my cousin Lily, and I said, Martha, I'm having a real hard time. I gotta be in love with this guy. And we're just not vibing, we're not, you know, I don't think he likes me. We just, I'm trying to connect and what I do. She gave me incredible advice and she, and it was real quick and it stayed with me. And two decades later, she said, you find something about him that day that you love. You love his hair that day. You love the way he talked to his girlfriend on the phone that day, or you loved meeting his mother, or, which I, I love Nathaniel's mother. Um, you find something about him that you love. And that's what you love that day. That's what you're in love with. And it was awesome. And it was a game changer. Now, as time progressed, we, we got, we became buddies. We really did. Um, he was always hot headed. He was always, you know, he's passionate. He's a passionate testosterone filled male, emotional actor, you know, who had been through a lot in his life and had a lot to prove and all these things, but he was super charismatic. He was a very good actor. He took it very seriously, mm -hmm. very seriously, which made me a better actor. I can remember a scene at the end of our storyline where I think I had killed Alec in self-defense, his father. And um, I had to like break down and cry and or, or whatever I was you know, it was a dramatic scene. And afterwards he came up to me and he shook my hand and he said, you're great. You're a really good actor. And he shook my hand. That meant something to me. Um, yeah, it, it, it did. Now, before he passed away, we had reconnected on Facebook. Like so many of us do. 
he had been um, sober for an amount of time. I think that made a big difference in his life. I know it makes a difference in anyone's life that chooses that. Mm-hmm. And um, and so we got to reconnect and kind of type and say, hey, you're awesome. You're awesome too, <laughs> buddy, buddy, buddy. You know, not love you, but you're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and so I felt um, full circle and and really good about that connection. Yeah, I miss him. Yeah, was, uh, I think many. I think many people do. He was a special guy, you know. I'm Probably. glad he went out healthy. You know, yeah. he went out healthy. I'm proud of him. Yeah, he did. And how tragic, you know. After yeah. all that, you know, fighting all fighting all those demons for that to happen. You know? You know, I um, mean, we don't know the decision. We don't know why things. That's why for me, I just I surrendered to life. I do the best I can. I try to do the next right thing. Like I said, I, I just pray a lot and I just got to guide me because we're just never promised tomorrow. And uh, he was in a car accident and uh, I can certainly relate to that. So, yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you yes you can. We don't have to go back to that. That's long time ago. And thank God yeah. you're all healthy. Yes, um, but you. speaking of, you know, um, I don't know the word I just used, but Ben uh, Jorgensen, who came on as Chris Hughes, um, <laughs> talk about, do you remember meeting him for the first oh. time? Did, did you yes. look at him and say? <laughs> so they had been searching for Chris Hughes for quite some time. And they Terry always and were. I, they always they? were over the years. Well, over the years, they always, yeah, they wanted a great Chris Hughes, you know. I think I went through two or three. I think I went through two, Ben being one of them. But Terry and I, you know, it was he was coming into our story. Was Paul, Car- was Paul Cor- Corver the other one? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Great guy. Um, but Terry and I were really excited because, you know, obviously Chris is coming into the, the Eddie Georgia Katie storyline. And so we had been screen testing. We just couldn't get the guy. And Terry finally said, they hired the new Chris Hughes. And I'm like, yeah. She's like, he's really good looking. I don't know if he's a great actor, but he's really good looking. I was like, okay, great, good. I'm like, is he he a nice guy? She's like, he's really nice. And I'm like, oh, good, good, good. And Ben and I met and instantly our souls connected he was engaged during um part of the time on as the world turns and and so i never i never had that romantic spark just more of like the oh what a good guy what lucky that his fiance is you know what a creative genius and what a good looking guy oh my goodness um, and and no he was not the best actor in the sense he had a terrible time memorizing his lines um but we had a connection that lasted well beyond the soap opera we ended up dating and um he certainly was my soulmate is my soulmate for three years and um i try you know i had to uh, unfortunately part ways with Ben, Ben suffered with a mental health disorder for years. I mean, probably for all of his life. Um, And during the time of the- Was that something you knew early on or did it present a problem during your relationship? Exactly. I fell in love with Ben, so to speak, while unbeknownst to me, he was on medication for his mental health disorder. And then he got off his meds and I was like, oh, what's going on here? And then by that time it was too late and I was in love and, you know, I'm a codependent. And so I did everything I could to help him. And, you know, unfortunately there was nothing I could do. And, um, I had to part ways with them. It was just too big of a, it was, it was too much for me to do. It's really hard to depart from someone that you still are in love with, that you still love unconditionally. Um, that was the journey of, um, me being a, a, uh, 
codependent in recovery, so to speak. You know, it, I just got to the point where I was like, I, I can't do anything. It's not good for me anymore. And I need to walk away from this. And it was really difficult. And then throughout the years, we kept in touch always. Um, sometimes more often than others, it depended on how he was. And then towards the end during the pandemic, it was, he was really, really ill. Um, and I, you know, there was nothing anybody could really do. And unfortunately it was too much for him to do. And he, he, uh, he left us by his own choice. And that's hard. That's hard because yeah. he was not that he was not that. I just want people to know that he was not that person. He was, um, well, and that's the thing. I mean, it is a disease and it is something we have to talk about. And it is something that, even if you are married to that person, it is not necessarily your, it can't be your responsibility because you are not a doctor or med or trained, you know, here you are a young woman dealing with something that you probably had no idea about it when it started. And I'm sure you learn a little throughout it, but it, that's a, that's a tough place for any human being to be opposite somebody who is, is suffering so, so deeply from a mental. Yes, yes, all of that, Alan, yes. And I think that we are starting to break the stigma um, for mental health and substance abuse. You know, you talked about being married to someone. I'm a solo parent to an eight-year-old because of a substance abuse issue. Um, my ex-husband, who i known since first grade, we reconnected at the age of, uh, there's my buddy Jax, that's my son. Um, but his father and I reconnected at the age of uh, 33 after knowing, knowing each other since first grade. Um, and we got married and I had Jax and we were married for about six years and the substance abuse overtook his life and at the time overtook my life. And so um, because of my experience with that, I became a member of Al-Anon. And if anybody is listening and your family members or loved ones are suffering with any kind of substance abuse or any kind of addiction, shopping, um, sex addiction, any kind of addiction, there's an Al-Anon group for you. And it saved my life mentally. I was have been a member for over 10 years. I would go every single day. And Al-Anon helped me, gave me the courage to walk away from my marriage. Um, gives me the courage to, thank you for putting that up there, Alan. It gives me the courage to uh, not be codependent, to be on my own. I dig in. If, if any of you people out there have family members or loved ones that are struggling, go to Al-Anon. It's free. It's an hour go to the website and find your local meeting and go. So it, it saved me. Um, and because of my experience, my life experience with Ben's mental health disorder, you know, um, he was bipolar. And then my ex-husband um, has a lot of issues, addiction being one of them. Because of that and my experience in Al-Anon, I joined the mental health um, business, so to speak, for three years. And I helped people um, through an organization at, in Nashville. I helped people get into treatment, any kind of substance abuse or mental health treatment that they needed. And I worked in that business for three years. And I see there's hope. Um, there are resources. Go to SAMHSA if you are struggling. I was one of those people that pick up the phone and say, how can I help? People would call me and they say, I have a cocaine addiction. I have a whatever it is. And I would find their uh, treatment. And I did that for a long time and I was blessed to do it. So there's hope you guys, my ex-husband's still struggling. He's estranged from us for those reasons. Um, but there's hope and there always is. So yeah. there is always hope, you know, and I, I told Jamie off offline, I had a friend whose, whose partner became an alcoholic and I took my friend to Al-Anon for the same reasons yeah. he, you know, he needed uh, an outlet, uh, somebody to talk to. And it's always good to have somebody to talk to. And just for the record, I am doing a show on May 10th on mental health. So I hope people will tune in with uh, some uh, Dr. 
and some other folks who have had experiences in mental health, uh, like Jamie, who have had partners or you know family members, and they will uh, share their stories because it really is sharing these stories that help other people, other people who aren't listening nor you know to things, but they tune in for for this and they learn something. You just sharing Al Anon, you know, there's we we all learn by the stories we share. So thank you for sharing that. Sure. We, we, I want to share my experience, strength and hope. That's what we say in Al-Anon meetings or in AA meetings and, um, or any kind of self-help. It's about ex experience, strength and hope and, and not doing it alone. We're not made to do this alone. And, um, also, you know, addiction is disease like diabetes. It's, it's, uh, you can be born with it or you can acquire it from lifestyle and you need medicine every day. And, um, for a diabetic that takes insulin, you know, an alcoholic or an addict needs to take their medicine every day too. And they can have a great, clean, healthy life. Just like a, someone that's diabetic. You just got to keep up with it. We all, you know, what's awesome though, Alan, I have so many incredible friends that are sober that are in programs. And if you are forced <laughs> with a, with a terrible, you know, you have a terrible thing like addiction and you're forced to look at yourself, you're forced to be a better person. And so these people that are working on themselves on a daily, on a daily basis, you know, what was once like a hinder for me to go to Al-Anon became a badge of honor because it made me be a better human being. It made me think of others. It made me think more of myself. It made all the things, all the things. So, uh, you know, there was a period of time that I was unsure if I had an alcohol problem. And I, it, it took me various um, ways to figure out how to stop. Um, like, you know, at first I was like, oh, I'll just have wine at dinner. And that didn't work. You know, it was a previous relationship. It was a previous time in my life. And I finally just cold turkey stopped, but I did go to AA and I went to Al-Anon because you're also navigating whether you stop or not, if you don't want to drink or you don't even have a problem, but you're navigating a whole new world, you know, mm. like the gay community drinks. So like yeah. all my friends are going out and I, you know, how do you navigate that, that new world for yourself? You know, I drink today, but it was a different period of my life. And I am very proud that I was able to stop for that period that I needed to um, and that's not everybody. Not everybody is, is able to do that. I wanted to share, Mary wrote, I have had a mental disorder since I was 13 and I met my husband in 1983. He has been with me for 40 years. He is a great man for being with me. Absolutely, Mary. And I am thankful that you have him at your side because that is part of, you know, when you're married or, you know, having somebody there to help. You know, you what you did is a brave thing to have to get out of a marriage and, and raise a child solo. But, you know, we do things for the people, you know, you're doing this for Jax. Jax right. does not need to be, you know, no child and for anybody watching does not need to be in that environment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's yes. And for, for you. Thank you, Alan, too. And the writer for sharing that Mary, I think. Mary, was her yeah. Name. yeah. Um, it's hard to, to admit things for the first time, but once you can start admitting them, that's when the healing starts. And it's interesting mm -hmm. that you, that your scenario, Alan, your story reminds me that alcohol or chemicals of any kind, um, it is not the disease. It, it is a, um, it is a side effect of the disease, right? So you yeah. drink to change the way you feel. So it's not really about the booze or the pills or whatever. It's about what's happening to you in that moment. Now, Correct. Eventually Correct. People can, yeah, people eventually can drink enough or take enough pills or whatever, um, Xanax, whatever it is, to become physically addicted to it. And then now your body, not just your mind, but your body, but your body is uh, uh, dependent on that as well. So for those people out there that do drink a lot, it 
doesn't sound, I'm not belittling what you said about you, Alan, at all, because no, it was a problem for you. But for those that are really drinking a substantial amount where you're shaking because you're not drinking, oh, yeah. those people need a medical detox. You need a medical detox. You need a medical detox for alcohol and also for benzos, which are Valium, Ativan, Xanax. If you take benzos for, for a long period of time and you quit cold turkey or you quit alcohol cold turkey, you could have a seizure and you could, you know, become brain damaged or worse. Yeah, so it's, very it's very dangerous. Uh, you know, Debbie just said, my son is battling alcoholism. Um, and he just got out of rehab. I, I pray for you, Debbie, and I pray for him. It, you know, and everybody, like like when I just decided what I decided, I was trying different things, you know, but yeah. I had to stop. Like at, at some point, I, I didn't want to wake up and be like, hi, I'm Alan Locker and I'm 40 years old. And you go, we've met before, mm. you know, like, you know, I, I, there were things, you know, um, it, it, it's just important, you know, you just have to hopefully be there, especially for a child and uh, yeah. get them to see, you know, I have a cousin right now who is battling addiction and just lost her mom. And, you know, her sisters don't think she's reached that point of really accepting that she has this problem. And I, I hope she does because it's a scary place. Well, I mean, the first step is admitting that your life has become unmanageable. Now, that's the same for an addict as well as a codependent. My life was totally unmanageable. I was counting pills. I was checking, you know, phones. I was, oh my gosh, I was crazy. And then the second step is we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And that's about surrender. And you surrender God, I'm giving it to you. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to go to meetings, but I'm giving you everything else and I'm getting out of the way and there's hope. And uh, I pray for Debbie. I encourage you to go to Al-Anon. If you, if you don't go to six meetings before you make the decision, if it's for you or not, that's what, that's what we tell newcomers. So <laughs> God bless you. Really, th Thank you for sharing. You know, b before we wrap up uh, as the world turns, when you look back, on that experience, mm -hmm. was it a happy one? Oh yeah. Oh my gosh, Alan, I'm 21 years old. I'm on a New York soap opera. You know, like, I mean, there's pretty people on New York soap operas, but we're not known about for our pretty lighting and, and stuff like that, you know? <laughs> um, the, it wasn't a fantastical show. There was no like demon possessions on our show or, anything like that. It was real gritty New York acting in the, when I say New York acting, I mean, Michael Park was going to do Broadway every night. <laughs> you know, like I'm getting, I'm rollerblading to, from, I was, I was letting Leslie's apartment. Remember Molly? Oh, I was yeah, Leslie's Leslie's apartment. I would rollerblade from the apartment through Central Park to CBS I would wash my hair. Love, they would do my hair and makeup. I would go to set all day, have the best job ever. It was awesome, Alan. I loved Rollerblading it. in New York City was one of my favorite things I've done. Can't do it anymore, but I, it was one of my favorite things to do. One of you my can do ones. it. You I can can't. I have, two, I have two new hips. I, I run what? and do things, but it's not good for that. Knee. I have a new knee. <laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> we're too young for all these new things. We really are. That means we lived hard when we were young. So I'm good. I'm good. We did. That. Charlotte was asking if you kept the beanie baby elephant. Do you oh remember the beanie my... baby elephant? Weird. <laughs> I'm having a memory of that. Yes. Whoa. I wonder what else I haven't thought about in years. That's adorable. Thank oh. you, Charlotte. Thanks for watching. Sure. Saying hello. Um, what was Ellen? What was it like working with Ellen? Oh, fun, fun. I wish she was my neighbor. Now, <laughs> I, you know, she was pregnant while I was on the show. She met her husband. Which is crazy. I which Angie's, is crazy. I think, just Angie's out of college. I think. No, 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 no. 
don't want to hear it. <laughs> Ellen Dolan was incredible. I to work opposite her, such a pro. Like I, this is what I'm talking about, Ellen. I'm working with people like Ellen. Are you kidding me? It's the best. She was so much fun. Off, we talked a lot off camera. She was amazing. Oh, I bet Ellen's. Yeah, I just saw her two weeks ago. Loved it. I haven't <laughs> seen her in person. Yeah. Um, we comment on each other's Facebooks. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You made a conscious decision to leave the business. Fame was part of that. Having witnessed it, you know, from from an really early age, and then having what what uh, fame that As the World Turns brought you. Talk about some of that. Okay. For sure. Yes. Yeah. So I was blessed. And it's very unusual to know what fame is like before you're famous. Uh, meaning for actors, for singers, especially now with the, with the internet, the interweb, all that stuff, <laughs> you become overnight, right? You don't know what fame is like until you are getting hit by it with a, with a, a sledgehammer. And so I was real fortunate to see what it's like you know I mean as a child I all my life I'm seeing all these eyes looking now they're not looking at me they're looking at my mom but I know what it's like I know um, what it's like to go on vacation and what it's like to have dinner and all these things you want don't get me wrong you want them because you are the job you are the brand they're buying your brand they're watching your show. They're listening to your, whatever it is. They're reading your books, whatever. So you want that. Um, but some people are born to be famous. Some people are not. My mother is born to be famous. No doubt about it. For me, I love people so much, but I didn't love being famous. And so when I, when I was on the soap, what was good about the soap, I loved being soap famous because they only knew me if they watched the show, but they really knew. <laughs> they're like oh my gosh they're in their living room every day you know it's interesting the difference between a tv actor a soap actor and a movie actor well maybe not so much movies anymore because of all the streaming um but for movies we go to the theater to see movie stars but tv stars we invite them into our home so we feel like we know them they're more approachable so especially soap fans now you always want to be the bad character Right. Ask Mara West. I love Mara West. <laughs> it was such so much fun. I adored working with her, too. But um, you always want to be that bad character and the villain. Georgia was a good girl. Katie was the bad girl. And in the end, I was OK with that because Terry and I, Katie, would be out like in a normal life, having fun. And the fans would come up and be like, Georgia, we love you. We love you. So good to see you. Da, da, da. I'm like, yeah, nice to see you guys. Let's take it. Oh, there's Katie. There's Katie, you guys. They're like, yeah, we know. We see her. <laughs> <laughs> that means she was doing a good job. Um, so yeah, anyway, being famous, I during the soap, it was fun for me to get recognized because it was marginal. But then when I got off the show, uh, after two years, Nathaniel, N excuse me, Nathaniel and I both got let go, meaning fired. Um, Storyline dictated, as they would say. Um, I went to Europe, to London, and I studied Shakespeare with Christy Clark from Days for Our Lives. And wow. we studied Shakespeare. And then um, afterwards, we went and they tra she traveled around a lot. But I went to Holland with her. And it ends up that As the World Turns is huge. It's huge. You in Holland. Yeah. I'm getting on the plane going into Holland, and everyone's looking at me, and I'm like, oh, "Is my foot? Is my bra? Like, what's wrong with me?" Sure enough, we go to check into the hotel, and the woman is watching TV, and she's looking at me and looking at her TV and looking at me. She turns the TV and she says, "Is that you?" I was in the hospital on the show, having just had heart surgery. So anyway. Georgia, as the world turns, huge, huge in Holland. So I got to feel what it was like to be famous for me, for Jamie, not for my mom, and all the time. And I was like, you know, I just, it just didn't settle. I felt like, goodness, I've, I've done this. I've proven that I can do it. 
but I'm one job away from my whole life being different in the sense that I can't leave mm. the house without makeup or, you know, I was taught not to <laughs> put on makeup. <laughs> now I, now I can not have makeup. I can have my overalls on. I go to Walmart or wherever. Like, you don't have pants on. You told me. <laughs> oh, oh, Alan, oh, no. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> but yeah it's true it's like i but that's uh, what we all did during covid because of this I, you know, know nobody had pants on <laughs> <laughs> so i just really felt like been there done that loved it extremely grateful but i miss it to be honest with you i miss acting I taught acting for a long time when I moved mm. back to Nashville um, for about six years. And um, that was fun because, you know, when I got off the soap, oddly enough, is when I studied, really studied acting. I studied b before the show, before the soap. I studied during the soap. But after the soap is when I really dove in and I almost um, treated it like it was my college. And I went to the Groundlings. I went to, I studied mm -hmm. a Meisner technique. I went to, of course, Rada in London, studied Shakespeare. And so I had gathered all these tools. And when I moved back to Nashville, I, I was teaching acting and the most fun, so much fun. I had a blast. So but I, I, do, I do miss it. But, you know, it's funny today. What time is it, Alan? Oh, um, so my son gets home from school in 25 minutes. And we are getting in the car and we're headed to East Tennessee to go to Dollywood tomorrow because we love amusement parks. I and um, we have our season pass holders to Dollywood. It was his big Christmas gift. But it's funny, you know, I'm on a Dollywood uh, Facebook page for pass holders and we get on like, you know, how's the crowds today, this and that. And I made a comment. I asked um, yes, the Dollywood. A fan, a fan <laughs> told me. So a fan, I asked the Dollywood, whatever, Facebook page, hey, I don't remember what the question was. And the person, somebody replied back and they said, well, I hope you're going to be there because I'm going to be there and it'd be so fun to see you. I used to watch you on the show and I'm like, oh, that's funny because it's been two decades. And um, so they're, they're still well, out there's, there. And there's a lot of people here today. And uh, we even had watching from the UK, love you guys and love oh. as the world turns. Thank you for your honesty. It's good to know you are not alone when there's really hard issues. Um, but okay. it's very funny. I, I wish I remembered the fan's name, but they told me they met you on the, you know, they were excited that you were going to be here today. And they said they had <laughs> met you on the Dollywood uh, okay. Facebook page. You know, nowadays, um, people will recognize me, but they think they went go to church with me. Yeah, you know, they went to high school, they went to college. <laughs> Where do you go to church? Where do you shop? You know, and and maybe it'll go on. And if I are meeting that person for the, and I'm, I can tell I'm, this person could be in my life, maybe after like the second, third time of, I know you, I'll be like, okay, here's how. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's That's fun. very it, funny. It's well, let's awesome. talk about how, you know, how did motherhood change your life? Mm, goodness. Well, I mean, in every single way, in every single way. Um, I was not planning on having a child. Certainly. I um, am very grateful that I did. God obviously knew what I needed. And yeah. he, Jack's um, my little buddy. Oh, there's Jackson, my mom. That was at his is, is she grandma or is she is there... baby? She's baby. Very it's nice. B E B. -E -B. B, -B. Um, but he, um, oh, there he is, is Captain Hook. So he was born um, 11 weeks early. So he weighed about two and a half pounds when he was born. And once again, going back to Al Anon, yes, I went into that room because of my husband at the time. But I stayed in that room because of the tools I was gaining. One of those being acceptance and surrender. And so there's nothing like acceptance and surrender when you're ba when you can't hold your baby and um, you know he's two and a half pounds. And so I had to put, I mm. had to put my trust and faith in the doctors and in the nurses and everything, because if I didn't, 
then you lose your mind and you go crazy. Right. And so it was having Jax was the best experience because even though he was 11 weeks early, um, we both almost uh, bit the dust, <laughs> so to speak. I was able, he was only in the NICU for five weeks, which is incredible. He was on oxygen for a year of his life. So mm -hmm. it's funny. He and I were both quarantined the first year of his life and then quarantined again. <laughs> so he's been quarantined about 20% of his life, but oh um, he's perfect. He has no residual effects whatsoever. Right. Um, we made it through. You know, it's the rear view mirror visual, the, oh, crap, I can't believe I went through that. When you're in the middle of it, and if you put your faith in God, or whoever, or for me, it's God. <laughs> you, whoever, it, whoever it is. Your higher power. You can trust and not, and not, and the fear can go away because fear doesn't come from God, right? So for me, um, for being a mom and the way he entered this world, being uh, like I talked about with Al Anon, I was able to just enjoy him in the NICU, enjoy the nurses who taught me how to take care of him and change his diaper. Oh, his diaper, Alan, was so small. You can't even imagine. Um, and so I, you know, my mom and I are very different mothers strictly because oh, of sure. dogs, right? So I am able to be a kind of mom where I, I mean, I do everything. I, I am every, I'm the maid, the cook, the mom, the, t you know, thank goodness he's back in school. So I'm not the teacher anymore, but you know, it's and, funny. And the the playmate is going to Dollywood tomorrow. <laughs> He's finally going to ride Wild Eagle, which is the big one. That's ride. awesome. It's Send just, pictures from Dollywood. Exactly. I will. I will. <laughs> but um, it's so much fun being a parent. Uh, it's also really hard being a parent. You know, I'm in Nashville, and Nashville has been in the news a lot in the past couple of weeks. And so um, we just do, I'm just doing the best I can. And um, he is so fun and loving and sweet. And he thanks me for being his mommy. And yeah. um, he's just. I love that. He looks so, happy. In the, you know, in pictures, he looks like a happy boy. And that's he all is. you can ask for. He is. He's very, very. He's a good boy, too. Good, good boy. Yeah. Bless. Jamie, so yeah. good to see you. Ugh. Well, this has been so fun. So fun, Alan. So fun. Thank you. Thank I'm you. honored that you asked me to do this. Oh, it's nice. I'm, I'm sorry it took so long. I wish we oh. had connected. I, I'm well, so happy. You know, Big it hugs. makes me happy. Same to you. It's just nice to be remembered. I can't believe that people actually remember. Um, they, they you know, it. Uh, it was a well written it. story. It was a well written it's story, so and pe people liked it. It was a well-written story. I was sorry to see that it had to end, yeah. um, but I'm grateful because it. I went on to my next chapter, and um, I'm. I don't regret it for us anything for a second. It was Good. literally the most fun, Alan. You were so kind to me. You were so kind to all of us. So patient. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine what you had to deal with with all of us <laughs> actors on so many shows. You were just. You were the lighthouse for us all, and you were so sweet, and I'm so grateful that you're doing this, and I'm just honored, so thank you. And thanks for everybody that watched. A lot of people watched. <laughs> They're sending their love your way, and they thank you for your honesty. Jamie, have a great weekend. Have fun at Dollywood. Thanks. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Alan. Love you guys. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you to Jamie for spending the hour with us. Please join me next Wednesday when General Hospital Casting Director Mark Teschner stops by. And next Friday, April 21st, we will celebrate 50 years of The Young and the Restless and 60 years of General Hospital with Carolyn Hinsey, Michael Fairman, and Stephanie Sloan. And I'd love to hear from all of you. Please send me a short note to tell me why The Young and the Restless or General Hospital has been your favorite soap opera. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. 
And if you liked today's episode, which I sure hope you did, click the like button. It always helps. And you can stream The Locker Room on your favorite audio platform. Just search The Locker Room. Have a great weekend, everybody. Please stay safe. And I will see you next Wednesday.